find the, uh, at what is called a, a functional magnetic resonance imaging sink, which is basically a, a tube that is put in, and we see it immediately, a tube that is put in a magnetic space. And this magnetic space is important because this magnetic space is very sensitive to uh, changes in the magnetic uh, functioning of a living being. And actually it turned out that when our brain, or brains generally, are active, then they use more oxygen in that particular part of the brain. And this, this huge equipment, you can see it in a soon, actually, this will stop there. Yes, you can already see this, so, okay, yes. So this huge equipment, what you can see here, maybe some people have already this experience of spending some time there, uh, which is not a very nice experience, actually. So this equipment is, is, is a, first of all, it's a big magnetic field, and it, it has to be so big because it's complicated to make a very strong magnetic field, but this very strong magnetic field is very sensitive to the activity of a specific part of the brain where more oxygen is consumed by the brain. And the magnetic field or this, this, um, this equipment is sensitive to these changes. So where on, the, on your brain or the dog's brain more, is more active, there's more oxygen used, and that's different from those parts who are not active at that moment. The problem for both for the EEG measure actually, and also, and, but I didn't mention it, but here even more, is that if you are starting to move your head in a static field, magnetic field, then you will never know where, what is where in your head, because obviously we don't know if the brain is moving. So the important thing is that in order to have any measure, you need a, 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 to fix the, the body, the body should not move. So basically what we really need in this case is that uh, we have to teach the dog through a compli not so complicated but you know specific training that the dog actually now this is the human how the human is uh, put in the this uh, scanner so you can see that now the human is coming through the position of the human is actually different what, if we, as you will see from that of the dog but this is how the scanner is operating mm -hmm. and then uh, hopefully we will see also that how the dog will be oh, come on it's explaining the result, but I will show it anyway. Yeah, so this is the images that you can get, for example, from humans. This is now the, how the brain is, uh, is uh, sort of cut off, virtually cut off, obviously, uh, in these sort of places. And then what we did, we did in experiments, I will explain it again, but you will see that the dogs and the humans were listening to particular vocalizations, human and dog vocalizations, in order to find out how the brain, and in this time the brain, is processing that. So this is now Marta explaining something about the training, uh, how she did it, and uh, the main part of the training is, I mean, the, the final, argue, final goal of the training is that the dog should remain still without movement, without actually forced to be in this position for six minutes, more or less. Uh, and the maximum he can move is about two three millimeters. That's what we can tolerate by recalibrating this, the, 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 the calculations. And here you can see now the dog is pushed inside the scanner. And uh, here the, and the, this is part of the training. These are just to, it's actually very good. It is not really strong there, so you can see the dog can move and the dogs can actually come out if they want. Uh, so it's loosely there, but it's good that you, I mean, and if you have been there, you know, and the dog can feel that something in, on your head, so yeah, then you are not really moving because if there will be nothing there, it's more complicated to concentrate on that aspect. So basically you can also, I mean, that's illustrating that dogs just love being in the scanner, uh, which is more or less actually true. Um, and and it works very well. Uh, so it seems to be that now we have a new methodology, at least in principle, to train these dogs for being motionless for a relatively long time, because this is what is needed from this technology. Then why they are uh, more, uh, why they are motionless, uh, through the earphone we can play them different sounds. These are just, you know what, I think it's human sounds, that what they can listen to. So here's the, the phone, yes. Uh, this is the other magnet, but we put it on the on the head, uh, of the dog, and you can see it's not there's no force in there. So of course we have to shape a little bit the position of the dog, but um, <laughs> then he remains there, and we usually have a, a person uh, there in the room, and then Attila is watching at the brain uh, what 
she, she can already see through the scanner some very simple imaging is going on already at the beginning and then he can say that if everything is okay the dog is in a good position and so on then we just start the experiment when the dog is listening to sounds and all the, now this is the dog brain I can see also different patterns of activity this is the human brain uh, for different uh, aspects and, 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 and so on okay I think we don't have anything more on this video that might be quite interesting now we can you can see that that's now the end of the experiment after six minutes and then the dog says can be a little bit See a surprise, what's, what's going on? Okay, so that's the... Okay. Um, before I show the results, I just want to show, because I think it's also important for you to really get the concept of what we are doing in a more general way, so... Uh, here, uh, here are, is the human brain, uh, I, uh, actually, and these are other brains, brain of a chimpanzee, a baboon, and so on, but here's a brain that we also are interested in, the dog brain, so you can obviously see that there's a big difference between a human and the dog brain, um, which actually is already a problem, and if you remember, there were many arguments saying that emotions, or other cognitive, even cognitive states, how can be compared, similar, in a way, if the brain, now the physical organ for, for dealing with these uh, states, are so, so difficult. And it's really a complicated issue because it's not really clear, even if you would talk to a brain anatomist, what part of the brain, especially the, the, neuro, the, neuro, no, no, the neocortex, so this, this big part, because then it's now from the top, so there's other specific parts which you can't see from this perspective. So, but specifically here, you can see that the human brain has this very specific uh, form and shape. The dog has also some sort of similar form and shape. These areas here are very specific. I mean, now this, so, so they are deal with some aspects of action or, or sensation or whatever, but okay, we know it for humans because we have 200 years of experience with a human brain, but where are the equivalent part of the dog brain? How can you tell? It's not a trivial question. Anatomists are having some ideas, but nobody really knows this. And this is one thing. Another interesting thing is that if you look at the evolution of uh, mammals, this is, these are mammals different uh, clades of mammals, groups of mammals, then, and this is a, a figure where most people now agree on, then you can also see that they're quite, I mean, here are the, where are we? Here are the primates, and then we have the humans here in the, quite in the end, but doesn't matter where you have the human, you can arrange it differently. What is interesting that if you go now back in time, you have this point, where humans, or probably actually the ancestors of humans and ancestors of all primates, so here is the all primates, are connected at this point, you know, at this point with the red mouse and rabbit. So these are the rodents who are actually relatively quite close to us. Uh, if you go more back in time, uh, like to this part, then you have another group of animals that is, for example, you have the ruminants, the cow represented by a cow, bats, hedgehogs, and so on, and the dog, which is now, I mean, this older sense, all of the carnivores, so actually cats and everything is also here. But actually these two groups, I mean the dog, so these animals, dogs, cows, and hedgehogs, together actually separated from from those other animals, which include now, at the moment at least, rats, mice, so basically rodents and primates. And basically when we compare the dog and the human brain, we go back to that point of evolution, so which is about 100 million years ago. So the question is that not, not just the, the idea is that basically, and because the dog brain is actually quite, has not really changed too much since this time, we can really see that what the dog brain is able to do, and now we take the dog brain in an abstract way, we represent the dog brain as a, as a you know, representation for all the carnivores and so on, we basically find out something about the brain that has been there for before 100 million years ago. And I think this is again a very new and interesting 
way how comparative neurobiology can be done. Because before this, the only thing what you could do is very invasive technology, comparing, for example, the rat and the mouse in laboratory. But this comparison with that mouse and monkeys, and in general, and humans, only gives you an idea, an estimation of this brain. But now we can step even back and say something about an older brain because the compass allows us to compare dogs and humans, which are actually, as you can see, obviously related, but this relationship is more distant compared to the rat and, rat and the mice. So that is one aspect. The second interesting aspect is that, which also is often criticized, it's an advantage and disadvantage. I mean, when you give any stimulus to a brain, uh, whether it's a human or a dog, we should be sure that the stimulus has the same sort of general effects, or the brain has the same, same sort of general experience with that stimuli. So if I would play back you know, music for the dog, uh, who is actually living in a, outside the garden and probably have very no uh, experience to Bach and Beethoven and so on, and you play back music to humans, then you find a difference or a similarity, but what can you find out from all these? Because the, the stimulus have probably a different meaning, or at, at least not just about the meaning, different types of experience generally with the stimuli. So having dogs and humans and choosing the stimulus in the right way actually can make the brain exposed to stimuli that they are sort of familiar with. So basically what you can observe is how they deal with familiar stimuli, what they have heard, have experienced, but now we can also not just see, not just know that they experience this, but actually can look at the processing, at the processes, what the brain is doing it when he is listening to that. So I think this mental method will really change in many ways how now brain research can be done, including the dogs, and you uh, should not be surprised that in, let's say, five years, you will have lots of scientific discoveries or, or just uh, statements about how the dog brain and the, the human brain is dealing with specific uh, stimulus. So what we did for these experiments, this is just again the, the same pictures from the film, you can see what's going on. So what we did in this experiment, we exposed the dogs to sounds, and these were different vocalizations, human vocalizations and dog vocalizations. Human vocalization and, and no language, so only non-linguistic vocalizations, laugh, cry, I don't know what. So all, I mean, I know, but I can't read uh, all of English. So anyway, all signs of human sounds that you can imagine, and uh, there, were, there are some databases on the internet where you can get these sounds from, and you can also ask people to, to go, for example, to yawn or others give other sounds, and then these were collected in this stream of sounds. And then we did the same with dogs. So they were barking, growling, whining, uh, or panting, whatever sound the dog can give, we also recorded them. You had to check them for loudness and many other things, but we put them in a, in a string. And for six minutes, this poor dog was listening to that uh, sound string with some silence in between. And uh, the, what you see here is actually uh, now, obviously, uh, that's why I'm showing the reason that how big the human brain is compared to the dog brain. So this is actually a, a large dog brain that you can see better the, the, the locations. So this is the true relationship is yeah. like this here. Okay, so that's the true relationship. And that's what we use for demonstration. So in this figure, what you can see is that if you look at auditory regions in general, so where the dog, the brain is working actively when he listens to different sounds, then you can see that, and this is now the, the one side, the other side, and, and the bottom view from of the brain for humans and the same for the dog. So basically, uh, what you can see here is that the red is for, for those places where we're involved when they have uh, heard, listened to a human sound, human vocalization, mm -hmm. then those sites that were involved specifically when they were look, uh, listening to a dog vocalization, and then they were non-vocal sounds, so like different noises from the street, uh, all cars, and technical noises from the flat, and so on. And then you can see that I mean, these are the relevant colors in each case. I don't feel and don't know too much about anatomies. I won't tell you Latin names because it's not important. What you can basically see is that there are specific areas, so it's not that like, the whole brain is active. There are specific areas where those sounds are processed. 
or at least are active when they are listening to them. And both in the dog and in the human, you find all this. So in the dog, you have a large place here. And actually, both of these parts of the brain, so this is the, the temporal part, actually, where we know from many hundreds of human studies that what we measure is actually good. So that's where it should be. But we have never seen, or nobody has ever seen, what the but the, how the dog brain is reacting, so we can now compare, and the dog is also having a temporal lobe, so basically the temporal part of the brain, and there is where they are processing now. Uh, either the blue, which is the dog sound, it seems to be that there's a larger area for dog sounds in dog brain, a smaller area for human sounds, just sort of the opposite in humans, and uh, dogs are also seem to be more interested or more actively processing when they're hearing other noises, and humans are simply not to be uh, affected. Obviously, you have to count, think about this, I mean, it's uh, that to see a critical way that even we try that the situation is the same for the human and for the dog, humans are actually, I think, more prepared to listen to strange sound in a scanner or in this strange situation than a dog. For a dog, really, this is a very, very strange situation anyway. So this is just generally. Now, what is more interesting is that whether, is there a preference? So whether you see parts of the brain which they really are specifically interested in listening to human sounds or listening to dog sounds. And the other issue, what we were interested in, whether the brain has specific areas where they would be interested in the balance. So how positive or how negative these sounds are. Because we know from human judgment that if I'm laughing or if I'm crying, that that's not the same type of, of, of emotion in terms of uh, positive or negative aspects. So laughing is something mm -hmm. positive and crying is something negative. At least that's what people agree on. And we also know for from people that dog vocalization, some dog vocalization might actually be <laughs> more positive than others. So basically we could look at, uh, do the calculations in a different way and look and parts of the brain that are preferentially uh, working when there are human sounds. And you can see that this is the red area here in the human brain, where really <clears throat> you see that there are large areas where there, these are red, and this is the area where the human brain is active only, or mainly active only, when they see something human. And that was long known, I mean long, 15 years ago, that was the first research on this, and uh, many people, I mean, the researchers at that time saw that this is a very specific human feature, I mean, feature of the human brain, that we have a dedicated area which picks up human voices. Whatever is laughing, crying, uh, giggling, whatever, but we have this sense of, ah, there's a human there. So that sort of humanness area for vocalizations. And they connected it to language and all many other things. So, but nobody really thought whether what happens when you're playing other uh, vocalizations. So, and then what is interesting that uh, for that, that in dogs we don't really see this area. So there's no such specific area that is sensitive to the human voice. Uh, but what they see, what we find here is this, is this uh, blue thing. What you can see here is very small and also another part. And then you find this is symmetric, this is asymmetric. So there are some uh, asymmetric effects in the dog brain which, and the human brain which are quite exciting but not important for us. So anyway, you see some blue little squares here that are specific parts of the dog brain where the dog, the brain is specifically interested, so to speak, or processing the dog vocalizations, whatever they were. So interestingly, this feature of being sensitive to your own species vocalization is not specific to humans, but actually also happens or takes place in dogs and is there. So we could argue, potentially, not everyone believes that, but we could argue that uh, this feature of a mammalian brain to be sensitive to its own voice, I mean, the species typical voice, is not a human feature, but it's probably more generally a feature of mammalian brains and actually even physically. So how you look at the, 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 the 
dimensional arrangement is both at the more or less the same size, same place in the brain. So I mean, this is somewhere quite similar, but obviously it's much bigger and much differently organized. But you can argue that this is the same location uh, for for dog and, and the human. Obviously, there are many criticism. You can say we don't have a red deer in this, uh, you know, in this uh, scanner. Obviously, because they have their antlers and there are little problems of getting them in there. But you could do experiments. I'm always say to the critics, please, okay, do do it. You have a scanner at home, probably, so you can try. <laughs> so I have nothing against the criticism that we don't, we cannot be sure that about this, but I'm quite convinced that if dogs have this uh, very specific uh, feature and the humans, because this evolutionary relationship is probably more that it's a general feature than a very specific one. Okay, this is one. Then the second color, what you might also find is this valence sensitive areas. So human voices, we know that have different valences, positive, negative, and dog voices, barking, mark, and so on, have different valences and, and so on. And um, for humans, we also found that that's the human, the color, this orange type, or no, no, keki, a color, which there is this region where the region is sensitive for valence, and how it works is that if the valence is positive, so it's higher, it's more happier if you like, then the cells in this region become more active. So they are reacting to that happy sounding, if you like, and they're getting more inhibited, so less activity is happening if the sound is less happy or has a more ne as a, as a negative, more negative uh, valence in that case. But, and what is interesting that although it's a low, tiny little one, but if you look closely, you have seen that you have the same for the dog sounds. So actually you have also the, for the human, so the dog brain, at least at the one side, so it, we don't know whether it, what is happening here. It might be actually just a quite asymmetrical situation. Also in human. So basically the argument would be that, um, that these violent sensitive areas in both brains seem to be asymmetric. So we have more in the right hemisphere than in the left hemisphere. And that seems to be both in the case of the dog. So you can see it's also more in the right hemisphere. You don't see anything at the moment in the left hemisphere. So again, there is this, it could be just coincidence that both have the same areas on the same side. Uh, but again, you would assume that maybe there is something really that relates to some homology, so some evolutionary sim similarity in this case. But what is also important, because whether it's left or right doesn't, doesn't matter for, again, for from our perspective. Now, what is more important that dogs and humans are able to analyze, I mean the, the brain in this case, is able to analyze the, the emotion, the, this vocalization based on their valence and they analyze them in the same way. So more activity when there is something positive and less activity when there is something negative and both for the human and both for the dog. So at the same place. So there is a, and what you could call a, a center of the brain in the dog and the human, which is dealing with the valence aspect of the vocalization. So that is a happy one. So basically, obviously, I try always to separate brain from mind because they are two different things, if you can say it like that. But again, looking at the brain could actually help us to have some evidence how the mind might function. Because if we have physical evidence that Valence is coded by the brain in a specific area, and valence seems to be coded not just the, 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 the species specific valence, but the valence from the other species. Then it seems to be really that the dog brain has at least the potential to react to the human sound when it expresses happiness yeah. and to the human sound when it expresses sadness or fear or whatever. Now, whether what this means for the dog in terms of their mind, we don't really know, but at least that is something, a strong evidence at least for this. So in a summary uh, for this experiment, which uh, uh, I think uh, raises, as usually an experiment should actually do, more questions than it answers, but at least we now have some physical evidence that there are these similarities uh, between the dog and the human brain. So you, these are the main points. And it's very important, I mean, that's why I will for sure make sure that you give these, you get these slides, because if you go to the internet and you put now in like uh, something like ephemery and dog and vocalization, in the last week, I mean, there was a huge uh, press uh, running around this topic. But what they wrote, oh my God. <laughs> 
So you have to kind of care. And that's not, I mean, we made sure. So there is some core evolution, everything what you can find. I am really one of the main opponents of core evolution in dogs and humans, but we always get this back. So that's, I think these are the main points. And please, if you read this text, you have to think that's not our uh, views, some of it at least not our views, and we don't really think about this. I hope I try to express or give it back the main results for, for this research. And obviously, you at the in a research, you have to make some sort of a statement at the end. But again, these statements are basically hypotheses for further research. So the statements are two main statements at the moment is that both humans and dogs have a specific voice area. They call it, this is from the human literature, voice area that is sensitive for they own, so dog for dog, for human for human, vocalizations, and the brain is recog I mean, probably how it works that this area is dealing with the sounds, and when they hear a dog and they and or a human, respectively, then this this part of the brain is recognizing that this is a human, this is a dog. For each species. It's, yes, separately. And then uh, the other aspect of this, this which happens again in both brains, that they are able to decode somehow the balance and this they the, this the decoding happens independently from the species so the dog brain can deal with vocalizations of humans dog probably also vocalizations from a cat actually so i'm not saying that this is specific to humans this is what a lot of people misunderstood actually that i'm not saying that this necessary is a human specific feature of the dog brain and not necessarily that our brain is just sensitive for the dog vocalizations probably you can do it with lion vocalizations as well we didn't test it for that but if you want you can do so it's not so <laughs> difficult now we have the method so but basically that also shows that if the dogs are able to do that and the humans are able to do that and the balance is so the positive and the negative uh, aspect of the vocalization is connected to some physical parameters and we show in other papers that this physical parameters is the one important is the pitch and also which I never mentioned did mention the length of the call then there is a physical uh, feature on the basis of which the emotional states of the other if this exists could possibly be recognized or this de uh, determined and I think this is important so basically it really means that if I'm I, if the, I come home and I, uh, um, or my daughter, not me, basically jump on the dog and, oh, 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 and tries this all this greeting with a high pitched sound and showing happiness, then the dog brain here gets very active. And how the dog thinks about it, this is another question. But at least we have a place of the dog brain that really deals with this information. And if my daughter comes home like that after a failure of getting an exam or whatever, then this is, will be never active for the dog. And again, whether the dog really senses that it's sadness or fear or I don't know what, X2, I don't know. But at least there is a physical possible little computer that has the chance to have something or dealing with this information and obviously it, it goes in the reverse way so basically we humans can also do it so it's not just about human emotions but emotional behavior of the dog can also be that with in that uh, sense so um, i think we should stop now there are still questions before you're running out for a coffee if somebody wants to ask